Hello there, my name is Thomas. Welcome to this edition of British Culture Albin Never Dies. It's the alphabet of Britishness, and today it's O. O is for Oliver Cromwell. Thank you very much to Patrick in San Diego. Thank you to James Bond Ireland. Thank you to Mr. Easy Smiles and Expensive Watchers on Instagram. This is an interesting one, to say the least. I previously did M is for monarchy, so it's really fitting that O should be for Oliver Cromwell, and I nearly covered him in C, as Kane, my friend in Fujo, had suggested Cromwell, civil war, constitution, and commonwealth, but I felt it was too complex to go in. I wanted a deep dive, and I believe I said at the time I'll, I'll go into this later. Well, now I will cover it. I have to say I'm covering it in a bit of a shallow dive, because I will include other topics, and I may yet return, but I'm not going to dodge it. O is for Oliver Cromwell, a hero to some, a villain to others, generally agreed upon as a very, very complex man. I'll start at the end, as many people do. He died on 3rd of September 1658 of natural causes, although many people have suggested that nervous exhaustion hastened his death at the early age of 59. As I say, he died in 1658. Within a few years, 1661, his body was dug up, hung, beheaded, and the head put on a spike above Westminster Hall. It stayed there for about 20 years until it was blown off a spike in a gale, and then circulated around in a range of colleges, museums, and collectors until it was buried in 1960 in Cambridge. In the 19th century, John George Fillimore, a Liberal Member of Parliament, attempted to raise money for a statue of Cromwell to stand outside Parliament, and Parliament refused, especially Conservative and Irish Members of Parliament. The statue was ultimately paid for by an anonymous donor. It's interesting if you go and look at it, uh, it is standing outside Parliament and directly opposite in the wall of St. Margaret's Church, uh, there's a bust of Charles I. It often goes unnoticed, it's staring straight at him, and Cromwell slightly looks away. There's a kind of popular myth that Cromwell is looking away in shame at the accusing stare of the king, um, which is unlikely given that Cromwell had his statue up in 1899 and Charles I, um, his statue was there in 1956. Nonetheless, it is a popular, popular myth and a good story and sets up um, the two opposing figures, Cromwell and Charles I. So that is the end. And if you've never heard of him before, I guess you must have many, many questions. Time to dive into them. But what was the beginning? He's indirectly descended from Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's chief minister, who helped usher in the Reformation, and who was beheaded in 1540 for his trouble. Thomas had helped, when he was alive, Oliver's great-grandfather and grandfather's cure, Bland. But their fortunes declined over the decades leading up to Oliver's birth, and declined further in his early years. His father died when Oliver was 18, needing to look after the rest of the family. He had education, but he saw his wealth just disappear in front of his eyes. He wasn't poor, exactly, although he was in debt, um, but he just wasn't able to live up to the expectations that he'd been brought up with. He, he got involved in local politics very early, and very, very unsuccessfully um, due to his raging temper. In fact, he'd had to leave his hometown because of this. He had considered emigrating to Connecticut, um, but was prevented by the government from leaving, I believe due to the debts. But something happened. Something incredible. He had these incredible fits of what's now considered to be depression on the one hand and may have had bouts of mania. He may have been manic depressive. We're not sure he lived that long ago. We have some records. We have pretty scant records of his early life, which is unusual. I mean, for a man who became so great, you expect his early life to be very, very mythologized. You expect people to talk a lot about this. Many would create their own myth. Cromwell didn't. For him, his real birth was his rebirth, his conversion to the strong, puritanical faith. He found living within a church full of popish ceremonies unbearable, and he regularly preached at an illegal religious assembly where he referred in a letter to the bishop as the enemies of God, his truth. When the chance came, he stood for Parliament and was elected uh, on the interest of a Puritan caucus in the town of Cambridge. Puritanism 
is the belief and practices of the Puritans, uh, while Calvinism is the Christian religious tradition based on the doctrines and forms of Christian practice in several Protestant reformers, such as John Calvin, as opposed to Lutherans. He had strong, strong Protestant religious beliefs. And that's important. This is a time when your your primary identity, what are you, is answered by your religion. It was also the time of Charles I. He was the king, crowned in 1625, the son of James I of England, the sixth of Scotland. James VI had been the first cousin, uh, twice removed, of Queen Elizabeth I of England, and when she died childless in uh, 1603, he became king of England as James I. Charles I like his father, believed in the divine right of kings to rule, and he saw Parliament as advisory, but not there for creating policy, let alone interfering with the the business of governing. Let's look at where this sits. The memory of the Reformation and Bloody Mary is still present. right? So Bloody Mary, as I've mentioned in a previous podcast, she had over 280 religious dissenters burnt at the stake, and many, many, many more exiled. She had died in 1558, 67 years before Charles was crowned. By comparison, 1945 was 77 years ago. The Spanish Armada was 1558, which is 37 years before Charles was crowned. So if we look back 37 years, that's 1985, the USSR existed. A view to a kill with Roger Moore was just coming out. Thatcher and Reagan were on the world stage. So again, it's just, just to look at how close together these events are. What's, what's going through people's minds? What are, they, what are they worried about? And in this case, it's very much the religious wars. The Spanish Armada was a Catholic war against Protestant England. Bloody Mary was a, a, a Catholic terror against the Protestant English. Now, I've been looking at how to explain, how to talk about Charles I, And I just found this wonderful description of him. It's straight from Encyclopedia Britannica. You can find the full article there online. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful insight into him. But I'll just read out this short section. All his life, Charles had a Scots accent and a slight stammer. Small in stature, he was less dignified than his portraits by the Flemish painter Sir Anthony Van Dyke suggest. He was always shy and struck observers as being silent and reserved. His excellent temper... Curtis' manners and lack of vices impressed all those who met him, but he lacked the common touch, travelled little, and never mixed with ordinary people. A patron of the arts, notably of painting and tapestry, he brought both Van Dyck and another famous Flemish painter, Peter Paul Rubens, to England. He was, like all the Stuarts, also a lover of horses and hunting. He was sincerely religious, and the character of the court became less coarse as soon as he became king. From his father he acquired a stubborn belief that kings are intended by God to rule, and from his earliest surviving letters reveal a distrust of the unruly House of Commons with which he proved incapable of coming to terms. Lacking flexibility or imagination, he was unable to understand that those political deceits that he'd always practised in increasingly vain attempts to uphold his authority eventually impugned his honour and damaged his credit. Again, perfect little... Perfect little insights his character there from Encyclopedia Britannica. In his early reign, trouble brewed. Charles, as a prince, married a Catholic, Henrietta Maria, Princess of France, and she refused to attend his coronation as it was a Protestant ceremony. As king, Charles surrounded himself with Catholic advisers, and Puritans feared, increasingly, a second Bloody Mary. Charles I got into a large fiscal deficit. He'd inherited it from the reigns of Elizabeth I and James I, along with ongoing wars with Spain's imperial possessions. And Charles offered Parliament no explanation of his foreign policy or its costs. He believed that was purely his own prerogative. In 1627, he launched an attack on the French coast to defeat, sorry, to defend <laughs> the Huguenots, French Protestants at La Rochelle. The action was led by one of his closest advisers, Buckingham, who'd failed on two previous occasions in Spain and was ultimately unsuccessful in France as well. Buckingham became one of the most unpopular men in Britain and was assassinated. This whole venture, these three failed foreign military adventures, became costly for the king politically, militarily, financially, and for the, for the third one, for Charles's marriage. The king ordered the adjournment of Parliament, March the 2nd, 1629. Before that, the Speaker was held down his chair. Three resolutions were passed condemning the king's conduct. 
Charles realised that such behaviour was revolution, and so for the next 11 years he ruled his kingdom without calling a parliament. This, of course, caused issues for taxes ever since the Magna Carta, ever since numerous rebellions all throughout England, but especially in the north of England. We'd seen that a king needs a parliament if he's to raise taxes, and the most common reason you need to raise taxes in our history is war. But these 11 years without parliament proved to be the happiest years of Charles's life. Now, at first, he and Henrietta Maria had not been happy. Um, and in July 1626, he preemptorily ordered all of her French entourage to quit Whitehall. But after the death of Buckingham, after he was assassinated, he fell in love with his wife and came to value her counsel. The king regards himself as responsible for his actions, not to his people or parliament or anybody else. But he regards himself as responsible to God alone, according to the doctrine of the divine right of kings. He believed his duty to his subject was uh, as an indulgent nursing father. Like many Stuarts, he neglected Scotland from whence he came. And at the beginning of his reign, he alienated the Scots nobility by an act of revocation whereby lands claimed by the crown or the church were subject to forfeiture. Inheritance tax, death tax. This is something that's come up before. I talked on my YouTube channel about Pontefract and how the inheritance of this castle helped stoke the rebellions under King John. We have it again here. History does repeat itself indeed. Charles' decision in 1637 to impose on his northern kingdom a new liturgy based on the English Book of Common Prayer was approved by Scottish bishops but met with concerted resistance. Many Scots signed a national covenant to defend their Presbyterian religion. So the king decided to enforce his ecclesiastical policy with force. But he was outmaneuvered by a well-organised Scottish covenanting army and by the time he reached York in March 1639, the first Bishop's War, he was already lost. He, he signed a truce at Berwick-upon-Tweed. Berwick-upon-Tweed is a very beautiful, beautiful border town, but it's, it's between England and Scotland, and it's switched over the different sides of the borders many, 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 many times. And it's a perfect place to sign a truce between England and Scotland. But he was a Scot. He came to meet them, they'd made their point, and he was able to make peace with the Scots. But he still needed money. And he needed money from the English. Charles was forced to agree to a measure, calling back Parliament, where the Parliament could not be dissolved without its own consent. He also accepted bills declaring ship money and other arbitrary fiscal measures illegal. Parliament generally condemned his moves during the previous 11 years, but he made these concessions, again visited Scotland, and now they were friends. They were friends, and the Scots agreed to support him against Parliament. He agreed to the full establishment of Presbyterianism in his northern kingdom and allowed the Scottish estates to nominate royal officials. Parliament saw him and the Scots getting closer and closer, and they also had news of a rebellion in Catholic Ireland. It reached, the news reached Westminster. Leaders of the Commons feared that if any army was raised to oppress the Irish rebellion, it might be used against them. So they planned to get control of the army by forcing the king to agree to a militia bill. When asked to surrender command of the army, Charles exclaimed, By God, not for an hour. He now feared an impeachment of his Catholic queen, with whom he was now in love. So he prepared to take desperate action. He ordered the arrest of one member of the House of Lords and five of the Commons for treason, and went with about 400 men to enforce the order himself. The accused members escaped and hid in the city. This epoch-making move was brilliantly portrayed in the 1970 movie Cromwell, in which Cromwell is portrayed by Richard Harris, who was Dumbledore in Harry Potter, and uh, Charles I is played by Alec Guinness, who was of course Obi-Wan Kenobi, among many other things. We also have Timothy Dalton, who played James Bond, um, not in this film, he played Prince Rupert, um, and Charles Grey, who was Blofeld in Diamonds of Forever as the Earl of Essex. It's, it's a brilliant, brilliant movie. And, and as I say, it's a very memorable scene. Uh, Charles I enters Parliament. You can watch it on YouTube. It's powerful. 
And a bit of an interesting story behind the movie. The writer-director, Kent Humes, read a biography of Cromwell in the early 60s and became absolutely hooked. And over the next nine years, uh, he read more than 120 books about Cromwell, toured England in his spare time, visiting historic sites, conducting research in museums, record offices. He was determined to pull together a tragic drama that would have all the haunting inevitability of a Greek tragedy. And then he met a movie producer who shared his obsession with Cromwell. (laughs) Now, despite this, there were lots of liberties taken for dramatic effect. In the movie, when Charles I goes to Parliament, Cromwell is there waiting for him. He's not in Parliament. In in reality, when Charles arrived with his arrest warrant, nor was he prominent at the start of the war. In fact, he was relatively little known. So they do take significant liberties to raise the stakes, to increase drama. Nonetheless, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal film quite honest to Cromwell's strengths and his flaws. It might have been more honest. Uh, There were scenes shot uh, showing Cromwell's campaign in Ireland, but they were cut uh, due to the sensitive nature of these scenes, especially uh, due to the troubles ongoing at the time. I will cover Ireland, by the way. We're just not there yet. But I'll just say this. Richard Harris, who portrayed Cromwell, was, some would say, the least likely candidate for the role of a Puritan leader who, according to many, carried out terrible, terrible acts in Ireland. But, although Richard Harris was a fierce Irish nationalist, Harris saw past the historical circumstances and became intrigued with Cromwell as a symbol of integrity, anxious to reform society. Harris insisted it wasn't necessary for an actor to strictly believe in the character he was playing. Instead, he drew inspiration from Cromwell's idealistic nature his goal to take the country out of aristocratic hands, and his rigorous self-discipline, a a trait that Harris admired. That I find particularly interesting, that Cromwell in many ways stands for something that the actor is wholly against. But he portrays him wonderfully, and I'd say it's a very, very sympathetic and very honest portrayal of this flawed character living in very difficult times. All that about James I is, of course, leading up to the English Civil War, 1642 to 1651. It's a series of civil wars and political machinations between the parliamentarians, the roundheads, as they're so-called, their short haircuts and their helmets, and the royalists, the cavaliers, often shown with long, flowing hair. Cromwell arose as the great Cromwell, our chief of men, as Antonia Frazier described, and that was was her byline for him in a great biography that really sought to... uh, to humanise a a man who's been seen as, frankly, villainous, a symbol of tyranny by many, many throughout the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. But it was in the Civil War that Cromwell rarely came into his own, raising, training and leading the new model army. A man with no military experience, Cromwell became a military star at the age of 46. Members of his new model army were liable for service anywhere in the country, rather than being limited to a single area. And to establish a professional officer corps, the army's leaders were prohibited from having seats in either the House of Lords or the House of Commons. This was to try and separate the army from the political or religious factions among the parliamentarians. The new model army was raised partly from veteran soldiers who'd already held deep Puritan religious beliefs, and partly from conscripts who brought with them many of the commonly held beliefs about religion or society. The Puritan nature of this army, and one that resonated rarely with Cromwell, their views resonated with him, his views resonated with them. There's a very close bond between him and his men. This was shown fantastically uh, in a Channel 4 documentary, Oliver Cromwell and the English Civil War. It's a full documentary, more than an hour, and I think, feel it gives a very, very good oversight of, of Cromwell, who is a complex character, and they, they look into the psychological elements um, of, of his life story, particularly what many in the modern day might describe as a manic depressive episodes. Of course, if you want to look more at the Civil War, there's an organisation called the Sealed Knot. I largely know them as a reenactment society. Um, they describe themselves as a charity that, well, they are a charity. They commemorate their history in a number of ways, uh, principally reenactments, uh, but also uh, school visits, discussions, lectures, the development of online resources, and so on. I'm not going to cover the English Civil War. I don't want to go through battle by battle or anything like that. I really want to focus on, on Cromwell. He was widely accepted as a military 
genius um, and had phenomenal leadership abilities that had him adored by his soldiers. He also had an utterly uncompromising worldview once he'd made up his mind on a subject. That could take time. It could take a very long time and sometimes decisions were really held up by his failure to come to any any real decision. But once he had a decision, he was ruthless in seeing it through. And this ultimately led him to hold England in his hands. He played little role in strategy at the beginning. He was engaged purely with his own regiments. And he was also <laughs> tirelessly self-promoting. He, he understood the power of the media, essentially. And he did self-promote. He feuded with other parliamentarian commanders. And this could distract him. But ultimately, ultimately, he was a war winner. He won the war for Parliament against the King. And again, it's important to note the religious dimension of this. It was a political conflict, it was one over taxation, but it was also one of the soul, which is part of why this war was so vicious. It was in how people saw themselves, they believed themselves to be utterly righteous, and the other side to be utterly evil. At least Cromwell did. Ultimately, Cromwell would be responsible for the trial, conviction, and execution of Charles I for treason. Cromwell signed his death warrant, among others, and there are reports of him laughing at Charles I's execution, not out of callousness, but out of nerves and hysterics. Charles I, the tale is often told that he was calm at his execution, he wore two shirts, so he didn't shiver due to the cold, he didn't want anyone to think he was a coward, he, he bore it well. Cromwell was watching it from a prominent location, the night before, there's plenty of reports on how he was kind of messing around with ink as he was writing letters, acting like a schoolboy and so on. And it's almost universally been interpreted that he was under immense pressure. People believed, you know, executing a king, what could happen? There might be divine intervention. People weren't sure, was this going against God himself? Was the divine right of kings imbued by God? People didn't know. It had never been done before. Executing a king. Dying on the field of battle is one thing, but executing a king for treason, this was, this was unprecedented. But it happened. It happened. The British Isles was declared a republic, named the Commonwealth, and Oliver Cromwell served as the first chairman of the Council of State, the executive body of one chambered parliament. During the first three years following Charles I's execution, he was chiefly absorbed in campaigns against royalists in Ireland, and in Scotland, and mutinies from his own people, his own army. They're inspired by a group known as the Levellers, an extreme Puritan party said to be aiming at levelling between the rich and the poor in the Commonwealth Army. Rarely, Oliver Cromwell faced the same issues as his predecessor. Debt, tumult over taxes, ungovernable parliaments, a restless army, and deep religious divisions in England. He granted freedoms to Puritans and... The previously oppressed Puritans became the oppressors to his absolute dismay. He took to bed for months, waiting for signs from God. But once he received clarity, he pursued those passions again violently. There was, at this time, the new media, of course, the printing press. People were churning out single-sheet issues of all kinds of news. It may be astonishing <laughs> to hear this. But when you have a new media out there, totally unregulated, some of it was not true. There were reports of uprising in Ireland, which was true. There was reports of terrible, terrible child killing by Catholics against Protestants. Abuses and terrors from the Catholics, which raised deep anger, especially among the Puritans who'd been on the receiving end of so much terror under Mary. They believed it was happening all over again, and of course the Royalists had largely fled to Ireland, from which they had previously been awaiting support. Some of the biggest battles, I skipped over it, but some of the biggest battles of the Civil War were over places like Bristol, which was vital because that's the main port between England and Ireland, and it was believed that Catholic reinforcements would arrive in England uh, at Bristol. But at this time, at the time of the, the Lord Protector, Oliver Cromwell, there was this terror that the Catholics were on the rampage. And this is what takes us to Drogheda in Ireland. Cromwell 
refused quarter to most of the garrison at Drogheda, who were rebelling against his rule. Drogheda is near Dublin, and we're talking about the events in September 1649. Now, at the time, Cromwell believed that what he did would prevent the effusion of blood for the future. He said otherwise what he did uh, could not be anything except the work of remorse and regret. And it's worth pausing on this one moment in time. There's a book about it called Cromwell, An Honourable Enemy, published in 2008 by the Irish historian Tom Riley. It is a controversial study of Cromwell's notorious Irish campaign, and it was timed to coincide with the 350th anniversary of Cromwell's death. The author has unique opinions, which are shaped by his hometown of Drogheda, the site of one of Cromwell's most notorious alleged massacre. Now, Riley's argument is that Cromwell was slandered, just as the Catholics had been, and that he acted no differently from other commanders at the time, although the moral questions of this are entirely different. What's very interesting is if you look at Cromwell, an honourable enemy on Amazon, scroll down to the reviews, and you can see that the passions around what happened there are still felt today. For many, it's what it came to represent. This is the seed, in many ways, of Irish nationalism. English history and Irish history are very much intertwined and would later be intertwined. But this is very much... kicks off later events. Let's have a look at Cromwell's own words. His own words were, The Governor, Sir Arthur Ashton, and diverse considerable officers being there, our men getting up to them were ordered by me to put them all to the sword. And indeed, being in the heat of action, I forbade them to spare any that were in arms in the town. And I think that night they put to the sword about 2,000 men. Now, the commander was English. He was a royalist from Cheshire, bashed to death over the head. Now, he and his soldiers were massacred after they'd laid down their arms. They'd been fighting against Cromwell. They shut themselves away in a fort. They acknowledged... The battle was not going their way. They put down their arms and went down to parley with Cromwell, and Cromwell had them slaughtered. This was not unprecedented at the time. Some historians would describe this as, as relatively normal at the time. There were generals who would allow people to go, and there were those generals who would allow people to be made an example of, and Cromwell was the latter kind. I'll continue again with Cromwell's own words. About 100 of them possess St. Peter's Church steeple, and some, the West Gate, and others a strong round tower next to the gate called St. Sunday's. These, being summoned to yield to mercy, refused, whereupon I ordered the steeple of St. Peter's Church to be fired, where one of them was heard to say in the midst of the fire, God damn me, God confound me, I burn, I burn. The next day, the other two towers were summoned, in one of which was about six or seven score, but they refused to yield themselves. When they submitted, their officers were knocked on the head, and every tenth man of the soldiers killed, and the rest shipped for the Barbados. The soldiers in the other town were all spared, and shipped likewise the Barbados. I am persuaded that this is a righteous judgment of God upon these barbarous wretches who have imbued their hands in so much innocent blood that it will tend to prevent the effusion of blood in the future, which are the satisfactory grounds for such actions, which otherwise cannot but work remorse and regret. His mercy in shipping people to the Barbados is, of course, a terror. People died on the way, and once arrived, they would most likely die of disease. It was a brutal, brutal action, and the reports of this massacre spread throughout Ireland, especially through the Catholic clergy, and are still very well known to this day. As I say, notice the, re the reviews on the book by Tom Riley. Cromwell, as Lord Protector, would go down in English history as a brutal dictator, a man who closed pubs, a man who prevented public dancing, literally banned Christmas. He didn't back the Puritans in their terror. For example, cutting a hole in a man's tongue for blasphemy, imprisoning people for life for blasphemy. But he did create the framework whereby that could happen. On the other hand, Cromwell restored England internationally through his strong army. He was keen to impress, especially the Catholic European powers, that England was a force to be reckoned with. But his brutal legacy in Ireland is still considered today. And he'd been the same in the English Civil War. 
pursuing fleeing royalists for miles and miles after they dropped their weapons and run, and writing about how glorious it felt to cut them down. He had won wars, but it was largely seen as peace that defeated him. He simply could not govern his British Republic. His mental and physical condition deteriorated noticeably in the final years of his reign until he died at 59. Parliament attempted to continue for two more years until the son of Charles I would bring back the monarchy in style. Cromwell was the only commoner to become the head of the English state over a century before the French Revolution. He would inspire many, many other republicans throughout the world. He had a noticeable effect on the American Revolution. The Irish Catholics, of course, the American Revolution, were royalists, the volunteers of Ireland, known as the 2nd American Regiment and the 101st Regiment, fought against the Protestant Irish, Ulsterman, Scots-Irish, whatever you call them. George Washington is said to have seen the Cromwell as a hero, but also as a warning. New England, by the way, at this time was heavily Puritan and was in the parliamentary camp from the beginning. So as Lord Protector of England, Cromwell left the, the American colonies alone. Um, only, only noticing it almost once uh, when the governor of Virginia was run uh, by a former member of Charles I's household, he demanded that uh, Berkeley resign. But he didn't arrest him or dispossess him. Again, Cromwell is an incredible figure from from a man who's relatively minor landlord, landowner who's in debt, unable rarely to make ends meet, becoming a fiery member of parliament, becoming an incredible commander, taking England, really, by his, by his political genius, perhaps also his military, military force, and then became a terrible, terrible dictator. It is a a unique story, in many ways a very un-English story. Um, N really had been for monarchy, and so many of these uh, so many of these alphabet episodes have been about a famous monarch. This is something so so different, and there's so many different aspects to Cromwell. Have I dwelled on the negative? Well, yes, there is a lot of negative. He does have his admirers for sure. But as I say, he's, he's famed in England as a, as a brutal tyrant who cancelled Christmas, and in Ireland as, as a bloody, bloody man. So it's very difficult, as I say, my own views coming through, there's so many biographies of him that look of him as a very devout man, a very troubled man. He was admired by many, but also much hated in his own lifetime. He is complex. It's difficult to see him as just one thing. Antonia Fraser simply titled him Our Chief of Men, and he was very much a leader of men. Those who followed him did so with the utmost, utmost devotion, and admired that even when he reached the very, very heights, he said to portrait painters, you know, paint me as I am, warts and all, giving us a phrase down the ages. He wanted an honest depiction of him, and has largely received that by history. His outstanding qualities have been talked about, and his negative qualities have been talked about. We had experimented just this once with a republic, and I think that experiment taught us. Let's stick with monarchy. Okay, so many people suggested Cromwell, and it is such a hard issue. I, I wanted to deal with it. I thought, what could be harder than this? And then somebody, I'm not going to name who it is, messaged me, how about two O's? You don't have to do it, but how about two O's? The Orange Order. Now, I'm not sure if any of my listeners outside the UK and Ireland know what this is, so I'd better just describe what it is. The Loyal Orange Institution, commonly known as the Orange Order, is an international Protestant fraternal order based in Northern Ireland and primarily associated with Ulster Protestants, particularly those of Ulster Scots heritage. It also has lodges in England, Scotland and the Republic of Ireland, as well as in parts of the Commonwealth of Nations, Togo and the United States. I must admit, that came as news to me. I have never, ever come across an orange order in England, 
or Scotland. I've never heard of it in the United States. I guess it makes some sense, nor have I heard of one in Africa. Um, the order was founded by Ulster Protestants in County Amar in 1795 during a period of Protestant Catholic sectarian conflict. The Orange Order is a fraternity sworn to maintain the Protestant ascendancy in Ireland. Now, it's headed by the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland and established in 1798. Again, this is, this is such a strange thing to my mind that I feel I have to go into it. The Orange Order exists on the equator. This is very much to do with the conflict in Ireland. So this really baffled me. So I looked and I found a BBC article on this called Orange Order on the Equator, Keeping the Faith in Ghana. Again, this is my own mind blown, so I have to read this article out. Torchlight shines on a war, with paintings of battle scenes from a late 17th century. It's just after 1700 local times, so there's no power yet. The electricity comes on at 1800. The battery-powered beam reveals a familiar figure of a king on a white horse. He is the Dutch-born British monarch, William III, a man whose image is on many gable walls in Northern Ireland. But this is one and a half continents away from Belfast. I am on the outskirts of Accra, in the house of Dennis Tete Tay, the acting Grand Master of the Orange Order in Ghana. Dennis's living room is full of photos, paintings and certificates relating to the Order. He tells me Orangism is in his soul. One photo pictures Dennis in a sash, along with a manual... Aboki Essain, who was the first African to be president of the Imperial Orange Council, the leader of worldwide Orangeism. Maybe I will be the second, said Dennis, with a gentle laugh. The Orange Order was founded 220 years ago, named after the king who defeated a Catholic army at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. It is perhaps unsurprising that the Order has outposts in countries like Australia and Canada, where expats from Northern Ireland have emigrated, but that is not how the Order took root in the West African countries, Ghana and Togo. The first Orange Lodge in what is now Ghana was founded in 1918. Then it was a British colony, the Gold Coast. A postal worker read about the order in a newspaper and wrote to the organisation in England asking to join. The Grand Orange Lodge in Ghana, like the eight other national Grand Lodges, operates independently whilst maintaining links with the Global Orange Organisation. The order says that there are several hundred members in Ghana, but numbers have declined. One of the reasons why I was eager to tell us its story was to correct myth and rumour. In Ghana, there is often suspicion around lodge-based organisations. Popular films show members engaged in occult activities. Orange men and women find this hurtful, and emphasise that their orangeism is simply a way to practice their Protestant faith. Deputy Grand Master Togby Subo II says, The order enlightens one's spiritual living. When you go deep into the learning and doctrines of the order, you know you are closer to Christ. Northern Ireland is a much more secular society. There, the organisation is considering its future direction as the troubles recede further and further into the past. A Ghanaian flag is one of nine flying outside the Museum of Orange Heritage in Belfast. It is one of the two museums recently opened by the order in a project that they regard as something of a watershed. So the museums tell the Orange story from the order's point of view, and they are hoping to attract Catholics to visit. This is all very astonishing to me. So here, O is for Orange Order. And if you're wondering about the colour, it is, of course, because uh, William III was Dutch-born. And that is the colour of his uh, country of birth. That's enough of that. <laughs> Patrick, uh, known as San Diego 007 on uh, on Instagram, suggested that O should be for double O seven, um, and was the only person to suggest this. I was, I was quite surprised. Um, of course, double O seven normally means Mr. Bond, James Bond, but of course, I've just been uh, reading through "You Only Live Twice," um, the early '60s novel by Ian Fleming where Bond gets promoted uh, out of the section. He gets a four-digit number, which is 7777. He keeps, he keeps that, uh, that number, in a sense. Um, he keeps his digit. 
And then, of course, in No Time to Die, there's all this question about 00 what. Um, but there is a real 007. Um, I believe I've referred to this before when I talked about uh, the Chinese view on James Bond. I, I think I mentioned it, which was uh, Queen Elizabeth I had a conjurer called John D, and he would sign his letters with two zeros to symbolise eyes. He was the Queen's eyes looking at all the, uh, the European courts, and seven was a lucky number. Uh, so he signed his letters 007 when he wrote in code. I'm going to go through the rest of them fairly quickly. Yvonne, the Facebook moderator of the Facebook group Britain, People, Places and Pastimes, suggested O is for OBE, which I really liked. Um, the OBE is, of course, the most excellent order of the British Empire. It's the British uh, Order of Knighthood instituted in 1917 by King George V to reward both civilian and military wartime service. Of course, currently... The honour is bestowed for meritorious service to the government in peace, as well as for gallantry in wartime. There are five classes of both civil and military distinctions listed in descending order and conferred on men and women equally. So you have uh, Knight and Dame Grand Cross, GBE, Knight and Dame Commander, KBE and DBE respectively, Commander, CBE, Officer, OBE and Member, MBE. So MBE is the, the lowest, and then OBE higher, so on, so on, so on. So the confirmment of the two highest classes entails admission into knighthood, and if a candidate is not already a knight and a dame, the right to the title sir or dame as appropriate. So, who got who got them? <laughs> um, so every year we have the New Year's honours. Uh, the Queen hangs out gongs. Uh, we had Katie Piper. Uh, was awarded an OBE for her work with Burns victims. So she founded the Katie Piper Foundation. dot org. dot uk for the website. Um, again, helping Burns victims. Uh, Jagtar Singh Gill of Kenilworth was appointed an OBE for services to the British Sikh and interfaith communities. Again, these community organisers are, are very much recognised by, by these uh, awards. You often have famous people as well. Spice Girl Melanie Brown from Leeds uh, was appointed an MBE for her work with vulnerable women. So, of course, you normally get the headline, Spice Girl, given OBE, or MBE in this case, uh, but in reality it was for her charity work, similar to David Prowse, who played Darth Vader in the Star Wars films, and it talked about how Darth Vader has been made a British knight. Um, but, of course, it's actually for David Prowse's charity work with the British Heart Foundation. You do have those, you know, representing Britain abroad, for example, in football. The Chelsea women's manager, Emma Hayes, was appointed an OBE. England men's assistant manager Steve Holland becomes an ABE, MBE after his side reached the Euro 2020 final and manager Gaz Southgate was already appointed an OBE uh, in the New Year's Honours list for 2019. Again, for representing British culture to the world, a CBE for the novelist Anthony Horowitz, who wrote the Bond novels Trigger Mortis and Forever in a Day, among other things. I, I try and keep with the Bond theme, I know that's how many people find this account. But now I'll move on to another topic. This is for George Orwell. Thank you very much to Kane. Especially, I mean, there are quite a few people who said this, but I really want to go into what Kane suggested. Now, Orwell is, of course, famous. He wrote 1984, and he wrote Animal Farm, and, and you can find plenty of information on that from literary types who, who know far more about this than I do. I don't think I'm a literary type. I think I'm not quite uh, well-read enough yet. <laughs> but I want to have a look at uh, a piece of writing I very much admire, which is George Orwell's a nice cup of tea. Now, this is, of course, the most important topic in the world, so it's worth spending a bit of time on. Uh, this this remains under copyright. Um, I found it online. Kind permission of the Orwell Estate, Penguin Books. Um, but it's under copyright. So I'm just going to skip through some of the points and, and give you my own perspective on this very, very important topic. Uh, what Orwell wrote is if you look at tea in the first cookery book that comes to hand, you'll probably find it is unmentioned, or at most, you'll find a few lines of sketchy instructions which give no ruling on several of the most important points. This is curious, not only because tea is one of the mainstays of civilization in this country, as well as in Ira, Australia, and New Zealand, but because the best manner of making it is the subject of violent disputes. 
When I look through my own recipe for the perfect cup of tea, I find no fewer than eleven outstanding points. On perhaps two of them, there would be pretty general agreement, but at least four are acutely controversial. So he lists his eleven pillars for making a cup of tea. First of all, one should use Indian or Ceylonese tea. Now, <laughs> not China tea. China tea has its virtues, uh, which are not to be despised. It's economical and can drink it without milk. There's not much stimulation in it. So he, first of all, sets out Indian or Ceylonese. Now, I have to say I have a pretty broad range of taste in tea, and of course I lived in China for six years. Pretty happy to drink Chinese tea, so... Oh, I'm not in total agreement with that first one. I better move on to the second. Secondly, tea should be made in small quantities. That is, in a teapot. Tea out of an urn is always tasteless, whilst army tea made in a cauldron tastes of grease and whitewash. <laughs> okay. All right, I, I could agree with that. He wants something uh, smaller and stronger. Um, okay, I, I'll agree with him on the second point. Thirdly, the pot should be warmed beforehand. This is better done by placing it on the hob than by the usual method of swilling it out with hot water. That's mental. <laughs> Sorry, George Orwell. I, I don't agree with you on that. I, I'm not going to heat it up on a. I'm not going to heat it up on a hob. I, I agree, it could be warmed. Um, but I think flushing it out with boiling water is it's cleaner. It gets rid of the dust if there is dust in it. Okay, still only agreeing with one. I move on to the fourth. Okay, fourthly, the tea should be strong. Okay, he said. Uh, what is it? He said that one strong tea is better than 20 weak ones. Ah, okay, okay. So, yeah, so the tea should be made in small quantities. Yeah, small quantities at one time. And the tea should be strong. Okay. I do like it strong. I mean, it depends what it is, but let's say standard black tea, okay. But not bitter. I don't leave it in. I don't leave the tea bag in so long that it becomes bitter. You know, I don't like that. Fifthly, the tea should be put straight into the pot. No strainers, muslin bags, or other devices to imprison the tea. In some countries, teapots are fitted with little dangling baskets under the spout to catch the stray leaves, which are supposed to be harmful. Actually, one can swallow tea leaves in considerable quantities without ill effect. Well, yes, okay, it doesn't harm you to eat tea. But, you know, if I'm drinking tea, I'd rather just drink it rather than eat it. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, this might be... That is now a half point <laughs> in terms of my agreeing with it. Um... Sixthly, one should take the teapot to the kettle, not the other way around. Uh, I don't care one way or the other. Seventhly, after making the tea, one should stir it, or better, give the pot a good shake, otherwise allowing the leaves to shet settle. Well, yeah, I'd, I like to worry it a bit. However you worry it, whether it's shaking or stirring, whatever, I don't mind. Shaking or stirred, I don't mind. Eighthly, one should drink out of a good breakfast cup, that is the cylindrical type of cup, not the fallow, sh uh, flat shallow type. Fallow? Flat shallow type. Uh, yeah, I like it out of a mug, but you know, I have nice cups as well, so you can drink it out of whatever you like. Um, ninthly, one should pour the cream off the milk before using it for tea. I, I don't like milk at all. Um, tenthly, one should pour tea into the cup first. This is one of the most controversial points of all. Indeed, every family in Britain, there are probably two schools of thought on the subject. The milk first school... Oh, no, I'm not, not dealing with that. Okay, yeah, you're dead right on that. Tea first, not milk. No. <laughs> Lastly, tea, unless one is drinking it in the Russian style, should be drunk without sugar. <laughs> oh, it's nice sometimes to have a bit of honey and lemon, but uh, I, I don't take sugar. So. Some people would answer they don't like tea in itself, but they only drink it in order to be warmed and simulated, and they say they need sugar for the taste. Those misguided people, I would say, dry, try drinking tea without sugar for, say, a fortnight, and it's very unlikely that you'll ever want to ruin your tea by sweetening it again. <laughs> Okay, so uh, how many did he say I'd agree with? Um, so two of them would be pretty general agreement, four of them controversial. Okay, I'm kind of maybe three or four, maybe maybe not quite. Um, <laughs> oh dear. Okay, this is this is important stuff actually. Um, Christopher Hitchens has also written on this topic. Douglas Adams has written a, you know, a piece on how to make a cup of tea. Uh, BBC News, how to make the perfect cuppa. There is an international standards organisation standard for brewing tea. <laughs> ISO 3103, if you want to look it up. Wow, he started something here. It's, it's been uh, over half a century and we're still talking about it. So, uh, so yeah, that deserves it. <laughs> Okay, time to move on to some, some serious suggestions. Mrs. Crichton, 
<laughs> she has come up with some stellar topics, so I'm going to include them this week. Um, o is for ocean, so I, I thought one way to approach this might be the Indian, the British Indian Ocean Territory. The term British Overseas Territory was introduced by the British Overseas Territories Act 2002, replacing the British Dependent Territory introduced by the British Nationality Act in 1981. Prior to that, the territories were officially referred to as British Crown Colonies. So, these are stretches of water still owned by us, uh, the British Indian Ocean Territory, <laughs> Biot, is an archipelago of 58 islands covering some 640,000 square kilometres of ocean, and administered from London is located about halfway between East Africa and Indonesia. Access is restricted and a permit is required in advance of travel. The British Indian Ocean Territory is not a tourist destination. Access is restricted, and a permit is required in advance of travel. There are no commercial flights, and permits for yachts are only issued to allow safe passage through the Indian Ocean, outer islands only. It's there for maritime resource, and there's also a military base there. It gets into the papers from time to time. Um, but it's also useful because the UK is committed to protect 30% of the ocean protection must put the conservation of nature at its heart, and the UK should demonstrate its international leadership via establishing... A, OK, this is all from the uh, the greatbritishoceans.org. It's a charity pushing, pushing uh, to preserve our oceans, which, to be fair, is a pretty worthy cause. They say that over 94% of the UK's unique biodiversity lies in the UK overseas territories. Fair enough. And there are many. Many of them. In fact, there's so many of them around the world. You've probably heard the expression, uh, the sun never sets on the British Empire. In fact, that's still true. Uh, it's still, no matter what time of day it is where you are, it is always sunny somewhere in a British dependency. Um, they are all around the world. Anyway, O, said Mrs. Crichton, is also for outer space. Um, and of course there have been British space programs, but they're mostly working alongside NASA and the European Space Agency. But in recent news, uh, last year, Sir Richard Branson rocketed to the edge of space with Virgin Galactic making him the first of a new space tourism type, um, people flying into space using their own vehicles. So he beat Amazon's Jeff Bezos and SpaceX's Elon Musk. Richard Branson was the pioneer, building his own spaceship and flying up. And he has this wonderful quote, I was once a child with a dream looking up to the stars. Now I'm an adult in a spaceship looking down to our beautiful Earth, to the next generation of dreamers. If we can do this, just imagine what you can do. He's a colourful fella. He's an interesting fella. Almost every story of Richard Branson is worth reading. I haven't read his book, <laughs> but I might well do so. He is uh, a self-made billionaire. I mean, he only started out as a millionaire. Um, his parents were wealthy, giving him money. And he, he's very, very honest. He's, uh, yeah, maybe my recommended rabbit hole is actually to listen to Desert Island Discs with uh, Sir Richard Branson, in which he's very, very honest about his... Uh, his humble, less than humble origins, um, which he talks about his multiple failed ventures, all teaching him different lessons and how he bounced back from them, learned them. He always wanted to be some kind of entrepreneur and, you know, okay, he, he had a good start in life, but he used it and used it so well. And as I say, became, well, the first man to build his own space rocket and go up, paying for it all himself and opening many opportunities for others. He's, he's a colourful character, great self-promoter, <laughs> but he's a, he seems like a cool guy to hang out with. I wouldn't mind. Okay. From interesting people to interesting animals. Not many animals have been suggested in the alphabet of Britishness. Mrs. Crichton suggested this one too, which is otters, the small mammals protected under the UK Wildlife and Countryside Act and also under European legislation. So they're mainly a river dwelling species. It's in the nature to eat fish and eels and crustaceans. About 40 to 80 percent of an otter's diet consists of fish. They're eating about one kilogram every day. I was looking around for some cool information and I found it in an ever reliable source, which is the BBC's Country File. Oh, I love Country File. Otters seek clean rivers, filled with food and overgrown banks where they can raise their cubs. Their favourite habitats include wetlands, rivers and coastlines. Though still considered rare, the species is widespread in the UK and can be seen in almost every county. The best chance of spotting an otter is to head to Scotland, the west coast of Wales, East Anglia and South West England. 25 years ago, the English otter population was on the brink of extinction after half a century of agricultural chemicals leaching into the rivers and polluting the food chain. Thankfully, following the ban of these chemicals in the early 90s, water quality increased and the slow road to recovery began. 
Fish populations return to the rivers and lakes, and as a result, you're more likely to see an otter today than at any time in the past 60 years. The revival of the otter across Britain has been one of the great conservation successes of the last 50 years. Having been threatened with extinction in the late 50s, numbers have slowly recovered. And following a ban on hunting in 1978 and improvements to river quality, otters can now be found in every British county. The otter's celebrated return to British rivers isn't welcomed by everybody. Some commercial fishery owners are concerned that these supreme aquatic hunters are taking prize specimen fish, and there have been calls for otter culls. Otters are efficient hunters, quite capable of catching prey as heavy as themselves, but they, are they really a threat to fish stocks? After all, a healthy ecology sh should support both predator and prey. A rise in predator population will normally force a short-term drop in prey species, and on rivers where otters have only recently colonised, the impact can be marked. The owners of managed fisheries cannot afford to wait for this equilibrium. A 30-pound carp may be 40 years old and cannot easily be replaced, and anglers will not be interested in fishing in water that has been depleted. Many commercial fisheries are man-made, but fed by streams which otters may follow and a heavily stocked lake is a perfect otter larder. Some fishery owners have installed fences around their lakes, but are powerless should an otter find its way inside. These mammals are fully protected under Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, meaning it is illegal to capture, kill, disturb or injure an otter, regardless of circumstances. Over the past two years, a group headed by the UK Wild Otter Trust, the Angling Trust, the Predation Action Group, and independent fishery owners have been working together to address the situation. And as a result, Natural England have recently issued the first licence allowing the trapping and removal of otters within a fenced fishery. Once caught, the otter will be released immediately outside the fishery boundary, causing the animal minimal distress and allowing it to remain on familiar or established territory. In a world where so many issues become polarised, this is a landmark victory for common sense. For as long as anglers and conservationists can work together and remain proactive, the otter can be a welcome and integral part of our aquatic environment. That article from Countryfile about otters. I really, really like that. Again, especially as they say, we do live in such a polarised world, and here we have groups that could easily have been thoroughly opposed to each other, but they came together, worked together, and are improving stuff. So I really like that. Another another case of improving stuff, I guess, is uh, O is for Oliver Twist, again, from Mrs. Crichton, um, who's a sounding board, by the way, for all these ideas. Um, so Oliver Twist is also known as The Parish Boy's Progress. It's Charles Dickens' second novel, published as a serial from 1837 to 1839, and then as a three-volume book in 1838. It was the first of the author's works to realistically depict the impoverished London underworld and illustrate his belief that poverty leads to crime. Fascinating that you'd be reading this in instalments. I don't think this year's as good as last year's series. <laughs> Anyway, I think it's, again, probably worth going to that, that great tome, the Encyclopedia Britannica, just to get... I know, it's just so well written, I like it. Charles Dickens was well versed in the poverty of London as he himself was a child worker after his father was sent to a debtor's prison. His appreciation of the hardships endured by impoverished citizens stayed with him for the rest of his life and was evident in his journalistic writings and novels. Dickens began writing Oliver Twist after the adaptation of the Poor Law of 1834, which halted government payouts to the able-bodied poor unless they entered workhouses. Thus, Oliver Twist became a vehicle for social criticism aimed directly at the problem of poverty in 19th century London. Oliver Twist was very popular in its first published, partly because of its scandalous subject matter. It depicted crime and murder without holding back, causing it, in Victorian London, to be classed as a Newgate novel named after Newgate Prison in London. While critics often condemn such novels as immoral, the public usually enjoyed them. Because the novel was also published serially, the anticipation of waiting for the next instalment and its many cliffhangers also likely contributed to its popularity. To this day, Oliver Twist is enjoyed by many for its historical social commentary and exciting plotline. It has been adapted for film several times, including in 1948 by David Lean and 2005 by Roman Polinsky. <laughs> Two very, very different adaptations. The 1948 is, of course, uh, great fun, and the Roman Polinsky one gets to the much more serious side of the book. Talk your fun.
<laughs> two, two fellas um, from Taylors of Love, Pete Brooker and Mr. Arlington Beach suggested O is for Only Fools and Horses. A great, great classic comedy about a wheeler dealer in London just trying to get by um, using whatever lies and cheats he can. It is, I guess, a great British comedy because, I guess, because the hero doesn't always come through because it is a character study. Stephen Fry was asked about the difference between British and American comedy and I think had one of the best answers, which is, you know, the American uh, you know, comedy hero is just a good guy and he'll have so many good quips and he'll come through in the end, whereas the British one is a bit more cynical. But also it tends to be a character portrait. So the, the star of Only Fools and Horses is Del Boy, just trying to get by with a wheeler dealer kind of guy. And you could say, oh, that man, he's such a wheeler dealer. He's such a Del Boy. Or from, say, Dad's Army, you can say, oh, that guy's such a Captain Mannering. You know, they become iconic, these characters. And you can really see it in the difference between the UK and the US office. The original British one is, of course, supposed to be a fly on the war documentary. It's very, very realistic. Some of it's very, very awkward, but it's the awkwardness of real life. Um, and it is the hilarity uh, of the awkwardness of real life. The US one is very, very different. Um, you know, it goes on season after season. That's not very believable. That's why the British one is only, I think, a couple of seasons. Uh, but the US one carries on and on because there's many more quips and many more you know, good lines. And the boss seems fundamentally good natured, which <laughs> is really not the case in the British one. Um, it's very, very different. I enjoy both. But it's just an interesting insight into, I don't know, comedy is so culturally subjective. You could talk for hours on the difference between British and American comedy and still be none the wiser. I enjoy Turkish comedy. Again, it's very, very different from both. Nothing is as culturally specific as, uh, as comedy, I feel. I'm going into the last few. Yes, we are entering the end game of this podcast. Uh, Sifu Lamas, thank you very much for your five suggestions. O is for Oi. O is for Orcs from Lord of the Rings. O is for Orlando Bloom, who is surely the opposite of Orcs. Um, o is for On the Dole. Uh, for those who don't know, that's when you're receiving government benefits. And O is for Oxfordshire. 007 Islander and Daniel Gast also suggested Oxford, I think, for runtime. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on that for now. Um, Sergio... Asavadolian suggested, oh, my giddy aunt. <laughs> That's a nice one. Um, JDealWist007 on Instagram suggested, outstanding. Char Lloyd 0926 suggested, off license. And Martin on Facebook group suggested, oat cakes. Yeah, I like oat cakes. Good Scottish oat cakes, thank you. Um, yeah, and finally, and finally, Purdy302 on Instagram. Um, this one stumped me for a moment when I read it. I asked, in the alphabet of Britishness, what does O stand for? And he said, it stands for of. <laughs> nice. Thank you very much for listening. It has been a long one. Um, but I hope you found it entertaining, informative, educational? I don't know. O is for Oliver Cromwell, and that, that was a topic and a half. I, I, I spent a long, long time on that, and I feel like a and honestly, I feel I could carry on almost for the rest of my life and studying that topic. It is, in many ways, a grim topic, a fascinating topic, and an enlightening topic. Thank you very much to everyone who suggested it. I couldn't dodge it this time. Um, I did before. And uh, I look forward to the next instalment in the alphabet of Britishness. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.